Thank you. So in the interest of efficiency, I decided to sort of recap the last lecture using slides. Everything I'm about to say there is in the notes. So it'll be about four or five slides, just to recap, and then I'll go to the blackboard. Um, so basically, last time we were in Europe, we were looking at five-dimensional supergravity, and we were looking at the class of metrics, which had a form at the top of the, top of the board, um, with some electromagnetic fields AI. And there were these electrostatic potentials, and for a supersymmetric solution, the gravitational warp factor Z is called that should be Z1, Z2, Z3. That should be related to the three electrostatic potentials um, by taking the geometric mean. Then there are some magnetic components for these electromagnetic fields. And then if you look for BPS, the four-dimensional metric had to be hypercalar. And then you have to solve these equations. And so last time we went through the solution to these equations in a very particular circumstance, where we took a given talking base metric this is a classic, it's not the most general hypercalar metric, but it's the most computable, beautiful, simple hypercalar metric, and therefore extremely useful. Um, it satisfies this simple constraint, it's hypercalar, and the basic form of this is to take V and have a bunch of given talking charges spread all over the place in the R3 base on the metal. So then, with the given talking base metric, it becomes relatively straightforward to solve these equations. The first step is to solve the first DPS equation, the self-duality of the max of the electrostatic uh, magnetic, sorry, magnetic fields. Um, and that means you've got to find topo topological, for smooth ones, you've got to find topological cycles and use the thetas as the magnetic, dual magnetic fluxes. And so, as I talked about last time, the given talking geometry has some very nice topological two cycles, which are obtained by looking at where the circle vibration pinches off at the given talking points. And then the, that it's an elementary exercise to calculate the cohomological cycles. And once again, because the Vs have this sort of singular form, the Ks have the same kind of singular form so that the net singularity cancels in the coefficient. And then the magnetic pieces of the Bs, or the three-dimensional magnetic pieces, follow the thread from the Ks. And then with that, you can calculate the flux of the cycle I left as an exercise, um, but it's basically given by the K parameters. So the th one of the takeaway messages here is there's a whole bunch of magnetic fluxes you get to choose in terms of these parameters. OK, the second BPS equation I also solved. And I said, here's the solution. It's straightforward. Um, basically, it's determined in terms of the given talking potential, these new magnetic flux potentials, Kj and Kk, plus a new harmonic function. But if you want smoothness, the new harmonic function is entirely fixed in terms of the old ones. You look at the asymptotics of the first term, which is sort of Kkb, and then P plus L, near an Rj. This goes like 1 over Rj squared in the top, and 1 over Rj in the bottom. And so to cancel it, you have to pick the singularity of the L functions exactly right. So it's a cancel singularity, and then the Zs become smooth. There's a constant term you can add to Li. I normalize it to be 1. That's just a useful way of normalizing the, uh, what will ultimately be the scalar fields or the compactification factors. But there is a constant term, and that fixes the asymptotics. As Z goes to infinity, Z goes to 1. OK, the last BPS equation, you decompose it along the fiber and in the base, the R3 base. And you can once again solve it absolutely analytically in terms of everything you knew before, but with a new harmonic function. And the new harmonic function, again, is picked by making, making things not diverge. And if you look at this, this goes like 1 over R cubed, but this one goes like 1 over R squared, or 1 over R squared, so the net 1 over R pole here. Similarly, 1 over R, and this goes like 1 over R as well, but this thing also has a 1 over R. So there's a net 1 over R pole. And when you put it all together, these coefficients in this M function have, are completely fixed by requiring mu not diverge. The last gasp of this is there is a constant in here. And you want to pick it so that the frame at infinity is not rotating. So you want mu to die off at infinity. And therefore, you're not actually in a rotating frame. And then the space-time components, which I've, or the, sorry, the R3 components, are then given by this rather elementary identity. You can check the divergence of this is identically zero by virtue of the fact that every one of those half functions is harmonic. And it's an elementary, although tedious, exercise to solve that. I'm going to suppress the details of solving this class of equations. 
So that's where we got to. I wrote down the complete solution. And then I, at the very end, um, pointed out a fact and then started talking a little bit about that fact that you can make the metric ambipolar. That means the DS4 metric, this thing here, can change signature from plus 4 to minus 4. It can change sign. It's allowed to. So long as Z changes sign at exactly the same place, because then you can compensate um, for the problem. And then Z squared turns up here, and a sign change there doesn't matter. And so in particular, you see from looking at this and this fact, ZV together must be strictly positive in order for this part of the metric to remain positive definite. So the first thing you get out of this game is you can allow it to be ambipolar, but you must have that bound. Now, I didn't say, well, didn't say it explicitly. But if you go back to the BPS ansatz, the ZIs were also constrained to relate to the scalar fields. And in particular, in the BPS story, you have these XIs, these scalars, and they're related to the Zs through the BPS equations. I think I may have neglected to say that. But the important point is here is you see that this tells you that Z2 and Z3 have to have the same sign. And Z1 and Z3 have to have the same sign. Z1 and Z2 have to have the same sign. So all the Zs have to have the same sign. And since Z, the big Z, is the geometric mean of all three of them, that, combined with that, tells you that you must have ZIB strictly positive for I. So that's the last sort of reg obvious regularity condition. If you allow ambipolar metrics, you have to allow, you can allow um, the change of these the four percent change signs so long as these guys all remain positive. It means these change sign with this. And as we saw, that actually works because these ZIs are of all the form KJ, KK over V plus LI. And in particular, it changes sign by going through a pole when V changes sign. And so this is basically uh, KJ, KK plus LI times V, which, could protect, which could, can be positive or not. Um, you have to check, but it depends on the choice of the flux parameters. It is not hard to find plenty of solutions where they're possible. Okay. So that leaves us with the question, are we sort of done? We've got all these nice parameters and everything else. What else do we have to worry about? And that's where we're going to pick up today. And oh, I've got one more slide. But come to that minute. Any questions or comments? So we've solved all the BPS equations. We've managed to enforce at least all the functions appearing in here. Um, K is equal to mu d psi plus a. At least don't have any poles. Mu d psi plus a plus omega. So everything, at least in principle, is not blowing up on you. But the last question is, are there closed time-like curves? Basically, we don't like time machines or anything else pathological. And usually, you abbreviate that CTCs. So the question is, are the closed time-like curves in this metric? And where are the dangers, and what do we have to do? Well, if all the Z, basically there's not much problem here. We'll worry about that. I'll say something about that in a minute. The primary problem is coming from the direction here, this circle. Uh, and if you look at this thing, you'll see that basically there is a piece of the metric where I'm going to take the t equals constant surfaces, and I'm going to find the metric ds4 hat squared to make it very sort of make it manifest. Then I get a minus z to the minus two uh, k squared plus uh, z times uh, ds4 squared. This metric will play a role in a few minutes, uh, a bigger role in a few minutes, I'll say more about it. But this is to highlight that if I take the t equals constant, that means dt is equal to zero surfaces, I have an induced metric which is not just the S4 squared, it has this term. And in particular, what I want to notice is I want to look at 
particular combination, which is the coefficient in here of d psi plus a squared. And in particular, what it looks like is it's z to the minus 2 times something or other, the quantity I'll call q. And q is equal to, you get a z from here times, uh, uh, times let's see, is it v to the minus 1? Yes, z times v to the minus 1. I want to actually multiply it by something else. q is equal to, let me write down the answer. squared plus minus, no, it's u squared v squared, and it's that, I think, let me just check, I've lost it, let me just cheat and go to, okay, I've lost it, I carefully made this slide, this one. okay, it's, wherever the hell it's gone, where's q gone, okay, let me skip through all of this, right, there's q, it's that, so basically, ah, z to the minus 2, v to the minus 2, q. The whole point is that these first two factors are going to be um, regular, nicely behaved, except to possibly v equals 0. But the point is that this q is given by this quantity. And in particular, what I mentioned last time is that q, on the face of it, could blow up. Notice this is zv. This is the thing that's regular on v equals zero surfaces. And basically q, this quantity, could potentially blow up very, very badly on v equals surface, zero surfaces because z1, z2, z3 has a v cubed in the bottom. There's a v, cubed, v to the fourth in the bottom here. There's potentially a lot of singular behavior at v equals zero. And last time I said q can be actually rewritten entirely in terms of all these harmonic functions. And it's perfectly smooth across the equal zero surfaces. So Q entered our discussion last time. But now it enters in a slightly different way. We've seen that it's not singular across the equal zero surfaces. But most particularly, look at what happens here. In this metric, it's the coefficient of d psi plus a squared. So we better have Q greater than or equal to zero. Otherwise, psi is a closed time-like curve. So we have a stronger condition, which is that Q has to be positive in order for this not to become time-like. The coefficient of d psi squared will go, if it goes negative, the psi circle becomes a time closed time-like curve and you have a time machine. So there is more. And what you have to do is you have to look at this metric ds4 squared. Um, for hat squared, which is where you put the t equals constant pieces in here, you extract the, the coefficient of d psi squared and ask, is this thing going to be give me time machines? <coughs> there are some other issues down here where there could be time machines at theta of 0 and pi. Those are called Dirac strings, but I'm going to hide that detail because it turns out if I deal with these dangers, it fixes the other potential dangers of Dirac strings. I'm not going to go there here. It's a level of detail. If you're interested, you can read about but what I'm going to do here is going to fix all the problems. So we have to deal with closed time-like curves. We need Q to be positive. So what do we do? Well, in practice, what we often do is we simply just start numerically sectioning the metric and seeing if it works. But there is an important first test. Step. And that per per set is called the bubble equations. We want Q to be positive. And in particular, what, happen, what can happen is that if I look at the points where Rj goes to 0, then think about, are there CTCs in the neighborhood? nearby. And the point is, the whole construction last time involved the fact that the zi's go to finite values. But if you look over here, and in fact last time we also removed the singularity, so mu went to finite value. 
But now, the trouble is that V goes like 1 over RJ. So as a result, generically, if you just throw down any old fluxes, you see that near the given talking points where RJ goes to 0, this term wins and this guy goes to a finite value. So you have to require the limit as rj goes to 0 of the um, of, of mu must be actually 0. There are n such equations or n such constraints on the face of it. Turns out there's only n minus 1 come to that. So in other words, Q must be positive everywhere, but you can do the very first obvious test. You look at the points where the given talking points are, where the thing where V is blowing up, and you see immediately there's a problem. Unless you impose this condition, there will be closed time like curves coming from this, or coming from this going negative. <coughs> okay, so now what I want to do is tell you what those equations look like. and introduce another very important variable, which will play a very significant role in the discussion. So we're not done. We have a danger of close time because we can get rid of it. Uh, let's see that for a minute, maybe. So mu, remember what mu was? It's k1, k2, k3, all three species over v squared plus one half ki, L i times v to the minus one plus m. Let's go here. Uh, there it is. This guy with all these choices of m and the one six. I've taken out the synchronization factor as a factor of a half. I've got that right. Good. So let's sort of talk heuristically about what it is. <coughs> Remember, k i's go like these flux parameters summed over R j. And V goes like these flux, uh, goes like the QJs over RJ, so summed. And similarly, the Ls do the same kind of thing, and the Ms do the same kind of thing. So what does this term generically look like? It looks like three of these K parameters divided by some uh, V squared parameters, so, so the QJs. Similarly, these involve three K parameters, one coming from here, but two coming from here. And again, this involves three of these k parameters in the numerator because of this. So basically what you should expect is that mu, as rj goes to zero, goes to a cubic in the, in the k parameters. In fact, it should be something that involves k1, k2, and k3. But the other thing also that's going to turn up is we've arranged by picking capital M so that there are no poles. So it goes to a finite value. The question is, what's the finite value? Well, it's going to involve the value of Rj. If I do this, let's make it very explicit. I want to put the limit as Ri goes to 0. So we're going to send Y goes to Yi. Yi. And in that limit, Rj goes to what I'll call Rij, which is defined to be the distance between Yj and Yi. So all these denominators, the finite pieces, are going to involve these limits in this limit. These are going to go to the distances between the given talking points. The singular terms have been deliberately cancelled by the choice of this, and so therefore the only pieces left are finite, and the finite pieces are going to involve all these cube, cubics and k over distances. All that to say, I'm going to introduce a quantity I'm going to call gamma ij. Gamma ij is going to be defined, gamma little ij, excuse me, is going to be defined to be the flux through the ij point, the second flux through the ij points, at flux, I J points, and with a QI and a QJ, useful for bookkeeping. Now, as you remember what the fluxes were, pi I 
ij was basically kj over qj minus ki over qi. So you see that this thing is nothing other than a nice cubic in these k parameters. And in fact, it's exactly what turns up when you take this limit. When you take this limit where I take ri goes to 0, then the left-hand side becomes the sum j not equal to i of gamma ij. And I promised these distances would all turn up in the denominators, and they do. 1 over rij. And I think I've got everything I want. And then there's going to be something minus something, rather, is, is equal to 0. Now, that's what all the cubics in the flux parameters generate for you. Let me just check if I'm not forgetting something. Yes, I've got it right. Now, there's one last term. The one last term comes from, remember I said I wanted the z's to go to 1 at infinity? I put a 1 in there. The reason for putting the z's going to 1 at infinity is I want asymptotically flat space. There are also terms that come from li which then in the mu parameter, li talks to the ki, which are linear in the ki's. And that's what this term is. And I'm going to put it on the other side. And it becomes two minus 2 mi qi. And then there is a p, uh, m0 qi, excuse me, a half. i equals 1, 2, and 3, ki i. I think I got that right. Minus two, yes, M zero. Okay, one half K I good. So where does that come from? As I said, that comes from this term where I put the one here and I pick out this term. And there's also a constant term in here which I've collected here. And the whole equation has been multiplied through by QI. So these are called the bubble equations. And they are exactly the requirement that this vanishes. This gamma ij is a very important quantity. Obviously, it's rather interesting. It's the inter it triple intersection, in some sense, of the flux for as the flux is in the solution. OK, bubble equations. So there's a constraint. At the very least, um, Frederick Deneff first discovered this sort of system, this system, but not in this context, not in this geometric context. Um, and he called them the integrability conditions. However, you have this constraints. There are n constraints on the face, face of it. And what you should think of them as is the following. I pick some flux parameters. Everything else, as I said last time, is then determined. And then these constraints tell you that the rij's are constrained. You can't just put the yi's anywhere. The positions y and i have some constraints. I'm going to say a fair bit more about these. And these are the constraints. There are n of them on the face of it. But if you look at this thing, all the fluxes are skew symmetric, which means that this is skew symmetric. And it turns out that if you sum both sides of the equation, you find the sum of these bubble equations is identically 0. So really, there are only n minus 1 constraints. This side vanishes, and the identity is about q and n0 and everything else, so the other side vanishes. So basically, at the end of the day, you have n minus 1 constraints. So in the very first lecture, when I was talking about multi-black hole solutions, I said we talked about the fact that you could put the black holes anywhere and they would be beautifully BPS. And it's a general prejudice about BPS solutions. In many people's minds, and you've got to be careful of this, BPS, there's a force balance. Uh, basically electric repulsion, repulsion equals gravitational attraction, and that was in it, that was part of the whole Gibbons Hawking, Gibbons uh, Hull story of multi black holes. 
And essentially, the prejudice is you can put BPS elements anywhere, and they'll just sit there. It is not true in general. When there's angular momentum involved, there is also there are constraints. And so things actually have some kind of potential that they're feeling that is actually pinning down a little bit about the distances. I'll talk about the number of free parameters we've got in a few minutes. But you should think of this also as some kind of force balance equation. In fact, I like to think of this, although I've not seen a proof of this, this is like finding the minima of a superpotential. Nobody, I think, has ever constructed that superpotential. I don't know, Joseph, maybe there's more to be said than what your paper we've got. But this is for, then, then it has only four dimensions. It's got well, only four dimensions, yeah. That's where we've got, got the beastly thing from. But it's, it should be like a minimum of a superpotential. It's saying these elements don't want to sit at a generic point. If you move them away from the generic point, then the metric objects hugely. It says, I'm going to screw you by making time like curves, close time like curves. So it settles down at the special point. OK. Bubble equations. Now, what's next on my agenda? Right. Bubble equation. Now, I want to point out one other very important thing about the five-dimensional metric, which is equal to z to the minus 2. I alluded to this last time, but I want to really bring it out now. dt. And I'm going to write this mu d psi plus a plus omega squared, and then there's a z, v to the minus 1, d psi plus a squared plus v. OK, so these bubble equations all of, are all about closed time-like curves. But remember where they came from. They are putting mu at y equals yj must be 0, or yi in my conventions. OK. So remember what, what I said last time about these cycles. When, you go, when rj goes to 0, v to the minus 1 goes to 0, and this cycle blows down. This z goes to a finite limit at all these points. So therefore, the circle pinches off, and that was the basis of the homology cycle. But over here, there's another contribution to the size of that cycle, and it's a negative contribution. And for it to remain pinching off and not become a closed time-like curve, mu must vanish. But put in topological terms, what this condition also guarantees is the topological cycles of the Gibbons Hawking base do, do continue to pinch off as you approach the Gibbons Hawking points. And so they do continue to be topological cycles. So there's a mathematical consistency in requiring this. It says that the topological cycles you identified here remain topological cycles in the full metric. But in the physics, it says there are no closed time-like curves. OK. One last gasp of this, and then we'll talk about some examples. We'll begin to talk about some examples. OK. So the last gasp of this. So what we've done is we've looked like I'll leave the gamma on the board. I'll leave that on the board. What we've talked about is this quantity Q. I said that Q has got to be zero, but well, positive, positive. Otherwise, you get a problem. And we looked at here, this is at R is equal to R, or RJ is equal to zero. There's a stronger condition. And this is the one that really you would like to have. It's not absolutely essential for microstate geometry, but it's very nice. And you would like ds 5 squared not to just have no closed time like curves. It's called stably causal. This is a term that I think Hawking invented. You would like the metric to be stably causal. And I want to say what that means. What it means is that the t equals constant surfaces here are always have always have nice time-like normals. Stably causal means there's a global time coordinate. It's 
sense, or more precisely what it means is that t equals, there's a coordinate t and the t equals constant surfaces are always space-like. And that means that that metric ds4 hat, where did I define before, uh, is always, let's see, where's it gone? It's z, ds4, the original square, is always nice and positive, definite, and bounded, and bounded, and so forth. If you look at what this means, you want a global time-like coordinate. What that means is that you're going to have to take your global time coordinate, d mu of t, d mu of t. This is how Hawking would describe it. If you've got a global time coordinate t, then that must always be strictly positive. There's always a notion of a coordinate that defines the time and direction at every point. If you write that down, it makes a slightly stronger statement. And the slightly stronger statement is that Q is not just positive, but actually there's a combination which I've lost somewhere. I'll do it from memory. Actually, I think it's just Q. Let me just say where it's gone. I've lost it. Is it here? No. Let me just skip, skip through. Did I put it here? No, I didn't put it here. Okay. Thank you, it is Q-max, okay, so Okay, so in other words, Q is not just positive, but it actually is bounded by the magnitude of this other, other term in the angular momentum. So there's a slightly strong condition you would like. What does stably causal mean? If you just simply have no closed time like curves, that means you've got no time machines, but it's possible if you tweak the metric infinitesimally, you can create time machines. So stably causal means that not only has the metric got no time machines, but any small perturbation of it has no time machines. That's why it's called stably causal. So this is the condition for stably causal. Now, let me say what we know. We have huge numbers of examples. So what do you do? Let me make a summary of what you do. So the summary. I want to keep that at the very least. And what you do. The whole process. So step one, or step zero, you pick a hypercalar base. We're going to count parameters here. Base. And so for us, base. And for us, that means you pick a given talking metric. And that means you're picking some parameters q, j, and you're allowed to put them in the integers. If you want asymptotic flatness, you're going to make the sum of the q, j is d1. But that's pretty mild constraint. OK, that's the first thing you do. Second thing you do is you pick your magnetic fluxes. Okay. Once you pick your magnetic fluxes, those are these parameters, k, i, j, at each of the points. So let's just start counting. Here you've got n parameters, or n minus 1 if you impose this constraint. Here you've got three n parameters. But in reality, I showed last time there was a gauge equivalence, so there are really only three n minus 1 parameters here, and so let's make this n minus 1 as well. So far I've got four n minus 1 parameters. Four. Three. What's the next of my shopping list of things? We'll come to that in a minute. Start with that base. Choose the flux. Those are equivalent to choosing fluxes. Then you fit. Of course, the choice of these fluxes, as I said, fixes li's and m's, which then fixes the mu's and omegas, so that there are no singularities. Okay. Last gasp is you impose the bubble equations to avoid, remove the CTCs. So I guess this is four. Which is 
involve this sum j not equal to i of gamma ij over rij is equal to something. This is n minus 1 constraint. So basically what you're left with is you've got 4n minus 1 to 4n minus 1 minus 3 minus n minus 1 free parameters. Now they're not completely free. Okay? So basically the whole set of solutions gives you 3n minus <coughs> 1 free parameters. And believe me, they are largely free, but we've still got to check some things. Remember, we have these constraints. We have to require that zi v is strictly positive for all i, and preferably this constraint. OK, that doesn't always work. It generally works or constrains the domain of these fluxes. They are still free parameters. If you find a solution for some particular set of KIs, there will be solutions in the neighborhood. So in other words, I'm not telling you that whatever you choose produces the right, produces a good microstate geometry. There are bad choices and there are good choices. And if you just pick something at random, you will violate this. Typically, if you've got them, so let me say what actually happens in practice. In practice, If you have ZIV Q, ZIV positive, and you've satisfied the bubble equations, then this usually works. I know of no example, a counter example. Do you know any counter examples? I don't know whether that's. So, in other words, you pick the flux parameters so that these are all positive, and you impose the bubble equations, then this always seems to work. And I know of no counter examples. Yeah, first of all. Do you know the here? No, except. So here's the point. There are no theorems that cover this at this point. There's just a whole slew of examples. The whole slew of examples tells you that basically, so long as you make this happen and you satisfy these equilibrium conditions of the bubble equations, you're good. You actually have a stably causal metric. What we do in practice is we make the thing we want to make, we make sure the ZIs and VIs are positive. And then we section the hell out of the metric, looking at the positivity of that, make sure this is no way. We just draw pictures, draw graphs, but we don't have any theorems that tell us that this is true. Now, I can tell you the intuition goes behind this in a minute. Yeah? Uh, I, I, and what is the omega there? Omega, oh, omega is the, is that what? this guy. It's the last little bit, of, a, this thing comes back and um, come, becomes part of this condition. So if you work out the inverse metric, you, you put the, where did it come from? It came from looking at G upstairs TT. Yes, I put its norm. It's norm in R3. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. I, it, it's a technical point. I didn't want to get too, too detailed. In, but it turns out that when you work out the inverse metric, the omega squared turns up in there. And you want to bound it below. So this, is, this makes the thing without time machines. This makes it stably causal. Okay, so um, there are no theorems. So let me <coughs> give you a little bit of insight into this condition, and then we'll say more about the top guy. A little bit of insight. Where the, what's this ZIV business? So remember, Z i goes to infinity like Q i over R, where these are the charges. Where V is going to 1 at infinity. And you should really think of this as really Z i times V is as in front of Q i over R at infinity. So the Z i V function is actually measuring charge. This is going to be a heuristic idea. Now, in the notes, and I'm not going to go into any great detail, in the notes I calculate the charges of these geometries.
And I want to point out there's one very nice way of thinking of this, which is if you look at the QI of the geometry, you can think of it as being made up of contributions from pairs of points in the geometry. And the QI coming from pairs of points is, in fact, something like one half. I'll get, I think it's a quarter, actually. C with a minus sign Cijk flux j to the point flux k through the ij point. So remember the basis of all these geometries. d star f is equal to star f wedge f. Oh no, no star, just f wedge f. And the whole point about these geometries is they derive their electric charge from the magnetic fluxes. And I'm telling you that if you pull out the asymptotic charge of these geometries, you find it's made of the sum of bits coming from every single given sort of pair of given talking points, every single cycle. And what those bits are is simply take the two magnetic fluxes <coughs> take the two magnetic the other two magnetic fluxes, combine them in a way that makes the electric source, and so every bubble is contributing to the electric charge through precisely its flux flux interaction creating the electric charge. And the total charge is to sum them all up. Okay? So if I tell you that ZIV is positive everywhere, what it really intuitively means, and I don't have a proof of this, but what it intuitively means is that the charge density, remember the charge density is being spread out into all these damn fluxes. This is a statement the charge density everywhere needs to be positive. So let me tell you something stupid you can do. You can say, I'm going to solve the BPS equations with a plus charge here and a minus charge here. You can solve them. That's beautifully harmonic source, 1 over R, 1 over R prime, with a plus charge and minus charge. You can solve these equations, get a solution at the end. What goes wrong is there's a huge region in between of closed time-like curves. The ZIVI is not positive everywhere. It's a, just a disaster. It's analytically solvable. It is completely unphysical because it fails this condition. So what this condition is telling you is that everywhere there needs to be a positive charge density. There shouldn't be some region which is net negative charge and some region that's net positive charge because in between there will be a region where this vanishes or goes negative. So this condition is really all about saying if you set up the given, so the practical point is, if you set up your magnetic fluxes, which you get to pick, you better make sure that the net contribution to ev from every bubble is giving you a positive contribution to the charge. If it gives a negative contribution to the charge, you're almost certainly going to produce problems, and this condition is going to fail when that negative contribution dominates over everybody else. So it really is a statement that this condition is a statement that the only thing that's really non-singular BPS is something where all the charge densities are positive. And that's what this is trying to tell you. Question? Yeah. Yes? Ah. Uh, this is these are the D4 and D2 charges in this system. So the D6 charges are the Gibbons Hawking points. And so they can be positive and negative so long as you satisfy the bubble equations. So you're using the D2 and D4 fluxes to... Sorry? Ah, oh, the D0 charges. They are the... Wait, which, which ones are they here? Um, they're in the... They're in the... No, they're in the M. They're, they're completely constrained in terms of everybody else. So, so the Ks are the D... Is it D4 fluxes? D4 fluxes. Okay, yeah. So the, Q, the Qs are the D6, charges, D6 charges. On there, you put D4 fluxes, and then everything else, the D2, everything else is completely fixed in terms of those. Because by, by non. Sm smoothness. Smoothness. Yes. It, I can get rid of this.
Yes, and, but, it's, but it, say, it says something very intuitively obvious. You know, the math doesn't care about you putting, the point I'm making is if you started this game and you didn't put any, um, you just didn't put any D6s on there, you simply just started saying, I'm going to make black holes. I'm just going to make Zs and I'm going to make them singular. I could make a black hole with a plus charge here and a minus charge here, and the math will go through perfectly happily. It's, but when you get to the end, you're going to say, do I have a good metric? The answer is no. It will violate this condition big time in between the two But these, these, are Frederick, these are Frederick's integrability conditions. Uh, I, I'm, sa I'm saying, OK, two things. It seems, to, based on experience, there are no theorems, as I say. Based on experience, if you make sure there aren't any localized negative charge sources, that's this, of any kind, and you satisfy the bubble equations, which means you make sure there are no CTCs in the neighborhood of the given talking points, it seems to make the entire space-time stably causal. And I know of no counterexamples, and Joseph and I have Count calculated at least a hundred of these, yeah, and Pierre's done a huge number too, right? As have my students over the years. So it, it just says positive charge, positive charge. No. So black holes. Monica, easy, easy case, black, black holes. Put v, you can put V as 1. You can make it R3 cross S1. Then it's just simply saying ZI is positive everywhere. It's to stop you doing the stupid thing, which is ZI is 1, that's the asymptotic region, plus some Q1 over R1, plus some Q2 over R2, with Q2 negative and Q1 positive. That is manifestly not BPS, but it will solve all the equations. Well, it gives you Okay. It solves the BPS equations, but it's but it has it's full of closed time like curves. It's just to stop you putting negative charges in places. Um, indeed. <laughs> it's it's a geometry. It's a geometric statement about ZIs. It contains all the D4 fluxes. Just going to just capturing some things I said a moment ago, and then I will so my, uh, minus a quarter. I think it's right. Okay, so in the notes I've written out in some more detail the uh, the the charges that you get. Remember, these solutions are supposed to have some electric charges seen from infinity and some angular momentum j left and j right. And we've reversed our conventions over the years, but I'm going to talk about a quantity called j left. J right is also in the notes, but the really interesting one is j left. You can also calculate it. Remember, I told you how to do this. You look at the asymptotics of G t G0 mu in the metric, the off diagonal terms, I guess I think I call them G0i, and you expand them. And you can read off the angular momentum vectors. This one is really interesting because it involves this quantity. And it is basically equal to a sum over all pairs of points, just like the charge was. I think there's, a, there's an 8 in there. And then there's a gamma ij. And then it is vector yi minus yj over the magnitude of yi minus yj. So the way you should think of this is it's a sum over bubbles. You've got the uh, i point yi, and you've got a point yj. And there is a bubble between them. 
But it says that each bubble carries a contribution to the left or right, depending on conventions, angular momentum. This is the unit vector pointing through the bubble. So j left, ij, each bubble contributes an angular momentum which has a direction which is the axis through the bubble, and its magnitude is given by this triple flux product. It's also the thing that turns up in the bubble equations. So really nicely, at least for the charges and the left moving angle, left, left moving left angular momentum, um, you can think of it as getting contributions from every single bubble in the system. And in fact, this gives you a very nice insight into um, later things you can do with this. There's a beautiful paper of, I'm going to get it wrong, there's De Boer, Van der Bleek, and Cheryl Shook, who the other one, Messamer, Messama, um, that shows that in fact, if you quantize the moduli space of these solutions, you do semi-classical quantization of these solutions, you should actually quantize the individual JLIJs individually. And that tells you something about the allowed values of the positions. But that's something I'm not going to go into. But the point about this gamma ij is it looks extremely weird when it first turns up. It turns up in the bubble equations I said. So I'm some j not equal to i of gamma ij is equal to something. But it really is the angular momentum of each bubble talking to its neighbors. And there is some constraint on them, which we will come back to when we talk about scaling solutions in a few minutes, or actually probably after we have a break. Last gasps. Uh, let's see. So the bottom line is you basically make the solutions. You can calculate the asymptotics. And there are three n minus 1 free parameters. That's a huge number of solutions. What I want to finish on is to give you an intuitive picture of what's going on in all of these solutions and why it is that this ambipolar nonsense can make things very smooth. OK. So remember what we're doing is we're sprinkling some Gibbons Hawking points across a plane, or across R3, and we're erecting a geometry over the top of it. And the geometry we erect is ds5 squared is equal to minus z to the minus 2 dt plus k squared plus z ds4 squared, where that's the Gibbons Hawking geometry. So this ds4 squared, there's a circle vibration psi, and there's an R3. And then there are these points where the cycles pinch off. Yj, and there are some charges, qi and qj. Now, to get a sort of intuitive picture of what's going on, if the qi's and qj's are the same, have the same sign, say positive or negative, the geometry isn't terribly surprising because what actually happens is if they have the same sign, if they're both positive, it's just the same old Gibbons Hawking GH story. And so basically, your cycle is your cycle, nothing. Similarly, if V is negative, it's simply the same old Gibbons Hawking story with the signs reversed. The interesting case is when, say, for example, this is QI is plus Q. And this guy is, say, minus q. I'll make them both the same. It makes life easier. And then there's a surface in between where v vanishes. So the question is, what happens there? And there's a very nice toy example I work out in the notes, but it's been worked out many times before in the literature. You start off by saying, let's just look at the simplest, dumbest example you can do with one of these horrible v equals zero surfaces and see what it does. So if you put, throwing away all the extraneous details, q over r plus minus q over r minus, r plus and minus, I'm going to write them in spherical polar coordinates, and something like that. So I've got two points with a minus charge and a plus charge, 
the z-axis is this way the radial coordinate is this way right you start with that now you take the k's and keep it simple i put all the k's the same and i make it some parameter k over r plus plus k over r minus remember i can shift k by v and not make change the physics so in fact this is actually the most general thing you can do if you set them all equal and once you do that Remember, L, M, and N are all completely constrained and completely fixed. And they come out to be, where's it gone? That's why I need my glasses. Do, 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 do. I've lost them. Yeah, L is equal to minus 1 over K, so one, 1 over Q, minus K squared over Q, 1 over R plus, minus 1 over R minus. And M is equal to minus 2k cubed over something like aq cubed plus one half k cubed over q squared one over r plus plus one over r minus so what i'm doing is i'm following my own prescription for just two points i'm even throwing away all the damn ones I'm basically saying, let's look at the neighborhood of a plus point and a minus point and ask what the hell happens to this. I pick my k's and I decide to keep it really simple. And once I pick my k's, everything else is fixed. If you compute this thing and calculate what ds5 squared is, and this is an exercise you should do, it turns into something insanely simple. There's a small, simple change of variable you do, and I, for this I need my glasses to read. Never remember how it works. Basically, you take the z, the, remember in R3, the axis is this way, this is z-axis, this is rho, and this is minus a and plus a. You take z is equal to a times cosh 2xi, 2xi uh, cos theta. Uh, sorry, that's z. And rho is equal to uh, a cinch to xi. This is spherical bipolar coordinates, like that. And you define tor as a rescaling of t is equal to aq over 8k cubed t. You mix phi 1 as a mixture of 1 over 2q psi minus aq over uh, 8k cubed t. And phi 2 is equal to phi minus 1 over 2q psi, uh, psi plus aq over 4k cubed t. Uh, phi is, of course, the azimuthal angle around there. You do that, and you find that the metric boils down to something extremely simple. It's equal to r1 squared times minus cosh. Uh, squared xi detour squared plus d xi squared plus sine squared sin squared xi d phi squared d phi 1 squared plus r2 squared times d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared where r1 is equal to 2r2 is equal to 4k. What does this say? It says that this very complex procedure is the world's most complicated way of making global ADS3 times S2, which is perfectly smooth, perfectly stably causal, as nice as you could possibly want. It is nothing other than global. The S2 has disappeared off the board. But the point is that this procedure, if you just localize on a plus point and a minus point, what is actually happening here is that this geometry, this non-trivial two cycle of the Gibbons Hawking, is actually becoming an S2. And then the rest of it is assembling into ADS3 global. So in other words, in the neighborhood of a plus point and a minus point, if you isolate it, the geometry is nothing other than just a the two-sphere being the two-sphere, big and fat and round. The radius is set by the magnetic flux you put through it. 
And the ADS-3 represents all the radial coordinates and everything else zooming in to form a nice, smooth bowl. It's global. The circle pinches off in exactly the right way. So a local model of the bubble geometry is to say, if V is positive or V is strictly negative, you've got all these nice, beautiful bubbles, and it's the sort of standard Gibbons Hawking story with big, fat fluxes through it. But when you change sign, it becomes an ADS-3 cross S2 on the money globally. And you know, you can imagine, so this is a, so the full procedure is a generic way of gluing together all these interesting Gibbons Hawking uh, points with fluxes. And when you change sign, you're actually slotting in a non trivial two cycle um, with ADS3 joining them together. Um, there's a nice follow up story to this is you can start figuring out what the intersection matrices of, the, of, these, matri of these solutions are. And in Gibbons Hawking, the story is well known. So for V positive or V negative, the intersection matrix of all the cycles is well understood. Here, it shows that, in fact, this S2 has zero self-intersection. It's a completely different species of fish than the thing that normally turns up in a Gibbons Hawking story. Anyway, I digress. The most important point about this is to realize that this procedure, when applied to the simplest possible case, which looks dangerous and extreme when you go through these V equals zero surfaces, it's actually beautifully smooth. And it's nothing other than the simplest, smoothest manifold you could possibly want. Apropos of that, the very last gasp before we take a break. The nice thing about ambipolar geometry is it gives you a picture, which is related to what's called blowing up points. or geometric transitions. So here's a way you can think about what we're doing. You can start off with a nice singular solution. Let's do a black ring or a black hole. Black ring is simpler. What does that mean? It means you take the zi's equal to qi over r. Um, actually, not r. Let's take it magnitude y minus some y1, some point in space. All the magnetic fluxes are zero. What it does is here's the middle of space. We'll take V as 1 over R, flat space. And out here somewhere, Y1, you put some singular sources. But they're singular all along the U1 fiber. So in fact, at this point, you actually have a circle that's singular, and that is a black ring. And this is the classic 5D SUSY black ring. And now you can do some magic. You say, look, I don't like singular solutions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pair create a pair of Gibbons Hawking points, Q and minus Q, here. Make them, keep them very small separation, let's say 2A. And instead of having the singular solution, I now turn this into fluxes with Ki's sourced at, let me call them R plus and R minus. I say, OK, now I'm going to take Vs, 1 over R plus Q over R plus minus Q over R minus. And now I start turning on thetas, following this prescription, but following this simple little model where I look at what happens in the neighborhood of these points and turn it on. And what you see down here is that this is locally nothing other than ADS3 cross S2. You've blown up a two cycle. The space-time is now perfectly smooth. You put all these magnetic fluxes on it, but it looks just like a black ring. So in the vicinity of this black ring solution, you can nucleate or pair create a couple of given talking points, plus Q and minus Q. Can't do this unless you're ambipolar. You pair create a pair of given talking points, and then you can replace the singular charge source by smooth magnetic fluxes. This is called a geometric transition. It is a very standard game in holographic field theory. It's a very standard game in a lot of string theory. It says, I start with a singular source, and I can often replace singular sources by completely smooth magnetic fluxes by blowing up cycles. I'm blowing up a cycle because I'm actually separating these points and creating a new cycle that wasn't in the space time to start with. I'm also secretly blowing up another cycle here, which is very thin and fat. I'm not going to go there. But then I load this up with magnetic fluxes. 
and I can make something that looks arbitrarily close to looking like this black ring. And so the way we tend to think about this, in fact, the way Yosef and I first sort of came at this, we said, look, there have to be some kind of, uh, there was a paper by Lynn, Luna, and Maldacena, which talked about exactly such geometric transitions in a very different context. And we realized there had to be something very, very similar in the black hole story. And we realized you could actually do this geometric transition and replace very singular configurations by, ver by smooth magnetic fluxes. And you can literally think of it as pair creating D6 anti D6 or Gibbons Hawking point anti Gibbons Hawking point underneath your singular configuration and redistributing the singular source into magnetic fluxes. And that's a good time to take a break. But, and we'll come back to whether you can do more and better in a few minutes, the taking stock aspect of this is what do they look like? And in particular, do they look like black holes? Or a sense of black holes? And if not, how do we make them do that? The ge answer generically is no. But there's a very, very important class of these solutions called scaling microstate geometries, which is something I've given a chapter all of its own in the notes, because these are, without doubt, the most important. <coughs> OK. And these are the ones that look at arbitrarily close approximation like BPS black holes. The word scaling has a very particular meaning, but you should understand this as meaning closely approximate black holes. But they are smooth and horizonless. So how do you get scaling microstate geometries? Remember what we have is we have a constraint on the positions of the Gibbons Hawking points in R3, generically, which are these bubble equations, which are constructed out of all the flux parameters. But particularly, there's a bunch of constants that depend on the flux parameters. And then the positions, or the distances between, neighbor, between pairs of Gibbons Hawking points must satisfy this kind of relation. <coughs> so what I want to do is I want to change the problem slightly and think about what I'll call the homogeneous bubble equations. And then we'll talk about move on to the more general one. The homogeneous bubble equations are simply saying, let's start with something simpler. Can I solve this? J is equal to 0, homogeneous. No right-hand side. We'll put the right-hand side back later. And for the moment, I'll just call this right-hand side, well, I'm, uh, I'll call it HI. But we'll get rid of this, and we'll just simply put this to 0 at the moment and ask about the solution to these. And let's suppose I can find a solution. But actually, maybe I'll give you an example of how you can find a solution. Suppose I want to do this. There's a very easy way to do this and solve these bubble equations. Remember, this is some j not equal to i. So what I'm going to suppose is I've got three points. And this is the most celebrated and simplest example. Suppose I have three points i equals 1, i and j therefore take 1, 2, and values 1, 2, and 3, just like I have here. I've got, they sit in a triangle. And let me suppose <laughs> that gamma i, j have certain properties, that they actually satisfy triangle inequalities. So gamma 1, 2 is less than the magnitude of gamma um, 1, 3 plus gamma 2, 3, and all the other permutations. There's a reason why I'm imposing this. plus gamma 1, 3, gamma 1, 2, gamma 2, 3, and so forth, plus the third. In other words, these gammas satisfy a triangle inequality. And the reason why is I'm going to take yi minus yj to be some multiple of the gamma i, the magnitudes of the gamma ij's. If they satisfy the triangle inequalities, then I can set up, set up the points so that this is the same, this is proportional to lambda magnitude gamma 1, 2. This is get proportional to gamma 1, 3 in magnitude. And this is proportional to gamma 2, 3. So if I actually have all the fluxes set up in the right way, and they satisfy these triangle inequalities, 
then I can choose lambda like this. Now, why would I do that? Because remember, this is a sum over j not equal to i. So this is a sum of two terms. And I've carefully shoved the magnitude in here. And it turns out that I can also arrange that this thing, since it looks like this, takes the, all the equations, constraints, what do they look like? Well, they look like gamma ij over the magnitude of gamma ij modulo over lambda. They look like 1 over lambda. And then there's a sign with a plus or minus sign. And another plus or minus sign with a 1 over lambda is equal to 0. And by flipping the signs of the k's, I can always arrange that this is of this form, and therefore trivially satisfied by messing with the signs of this, or the signs of the fluxes. So here is a really simple way of satisfying these homogeneous bubble equations. I can simply make all the points in my uh, points in my uh, given talking base have separations that are proportional to the magnitudes of the ga magnitudes of the gammas, and I can actually satisfy these bubble equations identically, because each of these terms there are only two terms, and they're either plus one over lambda or minus one over lambda, and if it doesn't work. If I get a 1 over lambda plus and a plus 1 over lambda, they reinforce. I can usually mess with the one of the flux side charges and flip it around and get it to be minus. So there are a whole slew of solutions that have exactly these properties. They solve the homogeneous bubble equations. Sorry? They're essential because if I want to do this, my goal is to make this as a solution. And these obviously satisfy the triangle inequality. Sorry? It's an ansatz. Yes, it's an ansatz. It's probably, it's probably the only solution here. But it's it, because remember, that all of these terms, in, in this, I've only got three points. Each of these equations only has two terms. And they have to be equal to each other, which tells me that the, you know, these ratios are all equal up to in magnitude. And therefore, I can muck around with the fluxes to get the signs to work so that they all cancel. So if I've got three points, I think this is the only solution. So, of course, there will be more general solutions. So, the point is, if the fluxes have this property, that they satisfy the triangle inequalities in this way, then the, there is an obvious solution, which is to put all the points on the, on the vertices of a triangle defined by the gammas. But notice that if you've got one solution, lambda is arbitrary. The solution is a scaling solution in that you can change lambda. You can change the scale. You can take a limit, lambda, to 0. If you take lambda to 0, all the points start coinciding. They get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So basically, the notion of it being a scaling solution for the homogeneous set is that there is a scale invariance where you can send all the points closer and closer and closer together and eventually perhaps even send them all on top of each other. That's why they're called scaling. Now, in reality, I don't have the homogeneous bubble equations. I have the inhomogeneous bubble equations, which are set by gamma ij. And now I'm going to use a sort of simple physical argument. I have to solve this where these are a bunch of finite parameters. OK. So all I do is if I want to solve this is that let me take the homogeneous solutions, which I'll call the yi noughts or something, set by i, uh, let's see, y naught j, satisfying the scaling relationship like that. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of the yi's and displace it infinitesimally away from the zeroth guy by something I'll call epsilon i as a vector. I can make a tiny displacement. And if I have a solution to the hi equals 0, this generates nine parameters that I can use to create a finite right-hand side. 
And uh, believe me, there are actually a lot of ways of choosing epsons. Satisfy this. You just displace the points away. And it, I, I stress, if lambda is small, this is an infinitesimal displacement because this is almost a pole when lambda is small. The yA minus yJ is going, this is gamma, this is going like 1 over lambda. And if lambda is small, if you displace a little bit away from a pole, you get a very nice finite large value with an infinitesimal displacement. So in particular, if you have a solution to the homogeneous equations, the scaling, a scaling solution, which is, solves the homogeneous equation, it's elementary to take a very small perturbation of it and turn it to a solution to any inhomogeneous bubble equation where these right-hand sides are some finite set of parameters, just by doing displacements of the points infinitesimally. Okay, so I claim that in the neighborhood of these, this solution, or this solution, by displacing one of these points, in fact, you only have to displace one of them a little bit, you can actually create an arbitrary right-hand side here. That finite value. People looking skeptical, you don't believe me? Maybe, but epsilon is uh, like proportional to lambda. It's tiny, yes, it's proportional to lambda because then when you do the Taylor expansion of this around there, you get a finite number because there's a one over lambda and there's a lambda. So it's, it's actually very, very easy to do. But the broader point is that when you have a scaling solution and you take lambda to be very, very small, a tiny perturbation of these points creates a finite right-hand side. And the fact that you've got, in any displacement, you've got exactly one displacement is enough to generate an arbitrary right-hand side or enough displacements. Okay? So you can do it. You displace the points a little bit. So, if you have a scaling solution, I want to now point out the following. That if you have a solution to the homogeneous bubble equations, there is a solution to the inhomogeneous ones right next door. So I'm going to take this to a, a logical extent. Suppose I can find a set of, let's say, p points. Let's, let's give it a name, set S of p points, such that I can solve solve set of j not equal to i for i and j in this set S of gamma i j y i minus y j equal to zero homogeneous points. I can then make a system. I can actually scale them. I can scale, well, I can find a solution to the bubble equations bubble equations, the full bubble equations, the inhomogeneous ones, where these points, yi minus yj lambda magnitude uh, goes to zero as lambda goes to zero for i and j in s. In other words, I'm just saying this trick I did with the triangle, you can do it with a bunch of points. Okay. These are called scaling solutions. They have very, very important properties. It looks like there's a terribly singular limit going on here. What am I doing? I'm collapsing all the points into a heap. If you don't understand the generalities, think of the triangle. And I, there is a very singular region of the moduli space where all the points seem to collapse onto each other. But actually, this is a good thing. So what do I claim? And let me make my life simple. Suppose that the sum of j in this set S of qj is 1. You can do it with 0, you can do it with anything, but I just want to make it 1. This makes then basically that v restricted to the set S scales like 1 over r. Here's my point S, set of points S. And I'm going to imagine, I'm going to look at a region where this is r. 
And I'm going to scale these, and there are other given talking points perhaps outside here, but I want to have an intermediate regime where there is a regime where S collapses to a point to, let's say, R is 0, and all other points points far away. So in other words, this scale is of order lambda, and this scale out here to these other given talking points is large compared to lambda. And in this regime in here, V is going to go like 1 over R. So in other words, I collapse all these points. All it cares about is the value of net given talking charge here. So this looks like flat space. It gets better. Remember last time I said that you can calculate charges from Zs and so forth? You do the same thing with the Z functions. What do they look like? Well, the Z functions go like KK over V plus L. And in this regime, this goes like some, some, some number over R, some number over R, some number over R, and some number over R. And therefore, it turns out you can actually call this QI of S over R in this regime. Let me give it a name, X. This is the region X, where you're far from this and far from those. And basically, remember, Z carry the charges, and QSI is simply what I, remember I talked about the pairs of points QI, IJ, for IJ and S. In other words, you can show that if you take the limit in this region, the contribution in this region between these points here and here is simply some net combination or quadratic in the flux parameters. But that flux parameter is a very simple interpretation. It's the charge that is localized in this cluster. So basically, now you can look at the metric ds squared. And remember, it's minus z to the minus 2 dt plus k squared plus z. And now we have v to the minus 1 d psi plus a plus v times dy dy. dy. Now, look at the asymptotic behavior of this. We've got v going like 1 over r. This is basically flat space. Because v goes like 1 over r, that's Euclidean in r4. It's r4. But you look at what z is doing. z is going like, I'll call it a, over R, where A is the geometric mean of Q1, Q2, Q3 over, um, let's see, how does it go? It's Q1, Q2, oh, sub S, sub S, sub S to the third. And it goes like A over R. Because each of the Zs is going like this. Z, remember, is the geometric mean of the three Zs. So therefore, this z factor is going like this. So what does the metric look like? The metric looks like, in this intermediate region where this cluster is shrinking to 0, this metric is becoming ds squared is equal to minus r squared over a squared dt plus k squared plus Z is R, plus, let's see, we've got to get this right. V is going like 1 over R. So let's see, we've got Z, this is going like A over R. Now V to the minus 1 is going like 1 over R, so it's going like R, d psi plus A, <coughs> squared, plus, and I'll write this in polar coordinates, 1 over R, dr squared, plus R squared, uh, d theta squared, plus sine squared theta d phi squared. OK, I'll put a big square bracket around that lot. Let's look at what this is. 
Look at where the, all the R's go. So this one over R, this one over R cancels that. So, and similarly, this one over R cancels that. So the, various, the factors you get are something like d psi squared plus a squared plus uh, d, th there's an a in front of it all, d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. And then the last part is this piece and the dr squared piece, which I don't want to hide in the middle. I want to keep this way out in the open. So it's going to be dr squared, let's see, it's a squared r squared, yes. It's a over r squared dr squared minus r squared over a squared dt squared dt plus k squared. And look what you've got. This is a three sphere of radius A. This is an ADS2 of radius A. So what you actually have is a black hole. It looks just like a black hole. In this limit, this metric is going to, in X, the metric is basically, I'll write it as dr squared over r squared, I'll throw away the minus r squared dt plus k squared t plus k squared plus and then a times d omega 3 squared. This is the near horizon behavior of a black hole in flat space. A black hole in flat space, if you remember I did it with uh, in Gibbons Hull solutions in four dimensions, it's always ADS cross S. This is the ADS2 of the near horizon region, and this is S3, that's the horizon. Of course, this metric has no horizon, but this is, so all this to say that if I take this scaling limit, it's not singular at all. This scaling limit is creating a long ADS throat and a sphere. And the size of the sphere is set by all the charges in the scaling cluster. So basically, I've got a black, something that looks arbitrarily like a black hole. And as I take lambda to zero, the metric stays exact, limits to this form so in this region here. So that taking this to zero simply extends the size of this region x. So here's the picture I want to draw. This peculiar limit that I've just taken that looks very, very bad in the R3 is actually extremely nice in the full geometry. And there's a sort of sequence of snapshots I can try and draw. So if I draw my, th say, three given talking points far apart, then the actual full geometry on this side of the board looks like some dimpled thing with bubbles. So it kind of looks like this. And maybe there's some curvature that descends it. And then there are three bubbles with the three given talking points. One, two, three. And then some geometry like this. If I shrink the points together so they're very, very close to each closer to each other, what happens is this long ADS throat opens up, and I get a very deep ADS throat. This becomes ADS2. And then there are these three bubbles that just sit at the bottom. The scale is fixed. Remember, the scale of everything is set by the charges. So this limiting process where the given talking points come together, the charge doesn't go away. What actually happens in the full geometry is that it fattens the whole thing out with a scale set by the charges. And taking lambda goes to zero simply makes the throat deeper and deeper and deeper. And actually, this yeah, log of r goes something like lambda. Yes, I did. I, yeah, I, I, there's some crazy scale a here, and that's probably right there. Thank you. So basically, the important point is the scaling geometry is extremely important. It looks like a pathological limit of the given talking points when they come together. When these things shrink together, it looks like you're making a very singular geometry. But that's from the R3 perspective. 
from the perspective of the full geometry, everything may stay as big and fat and round, held up by fluxes. And this lambda goes to zero really measures the depth of the ADS throat. And by choosing lambda as small as you like, you can extend the ADS throat as deep as you like, and you can make it look like a black hole to arbitrary precision. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So that's why I made that. That's why I made that. Sorry. Well, that's why I made that comment before. Um, the pl the moduli space is quantized, and therefore the the rijs are quantized. So you, there is a discrete. So there's a limit to the depth you can go, and that limit is something we've analysed, and it gives us the right gap for the conformal field theory. So we 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 actually have looked at some well. Take, Lots of people looked at semi-classical quantization of these geometries, and there is a limit to the depth, but it's extremely deep. It gives you the right redshift for the right typical sector of the conformal field theory. So indeed, in the classical geometry, you can make this arbitrarily deep. But quantum mechanics says, you know, imagine the following. I make an excitation in here. This is what we call entropy elevators or something, but it was, um, you can make it, imagine you make an, ex an excitation at the bottom of the throat. It has an energy naively which is 1 over the width, which is 1 over A, roughly speaking. However, it's, that's not its energy. You've got to multiply by the redshift, which is roughly lambda. So therefore, you can make excitations that look big and fat. You know, This could be a kilometer wavelength thing. But by making the throat very, very deep, you can make its energy arbitrarily small. There is a limit to how small you can make it is driven by the quantum quantization of the geometry. So, so when you get into the quantum, so here's the other surreal thing. Well, we're heading into a direction that I wasn't going to talk about in this class, but the, but the point is that once you semi-classic, you can build this thing five megaparsecs wide. You can make the bubbles a megaparsec big. But if you make the throat arbitrarily deep, one h-bar of quantum fluctuation, you can wipe it all out. So I'm talking about things that are macroscopically huge in the classical geometry. And normally you would think of them as being completely, quantum considerations to be completely irrelevant. But in these geometries, if you make them very, very deep, the quantum fluctuations can wipe out macroscopic geometry. Yeah. So there's a quantum limit to the depth you can make. But that actually turns out it's a feature, not a bug. And the feature is it gives you the right holographic field theory discussion. You can back react it, sure. Uh, but if you get too deep, the back reaction, you know, you know, you can back react it. It's just fine. One single wave. You can ask, is there other unstable modes? The answer seems to be there's a lot of debate about that in literature. I don't want to go there. There's meant to be, we can talk afterwards. OK, so scaling geometries. There are lots of them. There are many, many examples. They are probably the most important example. And the scaling geometries mean that they look arbitrarily close to black hole geometries. Arbitrary close means you can make the throat as deep as you like. But remember, these are smooth and horizonless. And these are singular with horizon, horizon plus singularity. So the basic idea in the microstate geometry program is to argue that this is better than that, and therefore you should probably replace your semi-classical description of a black hole by this. And you can make things that are, look arbitrarily close to black holes. However, let me stress, so far BPS is most of what we studied. Not everything, but remember that most, everything I'm saying in this course is BPS. OK, so I've talked about scaling microstate geometries. Um, probably the most important example. I gave them a whole separate section in the notes just as a result. The last part of the notes I've produced contains a sort of, where do you go from here? What can you do? So at this point, we're about up to micro the story of microstate geometries up until about 2010. And now there's a whole lot of stuff that's gone on in the last nine years. And I'm going to sort of survey it and talk about bits of it, unless there are questions. 
not, not with this, a lot of parameters, but very, very sub-leading entropy. So maybe I should make some. You need more. So let me sort of summarize the sort of topics, and I'll say something, try and say something about all of them at some point. OK. So we can talk about string theory and M-theory realizations. After all, we want to embed this in M theory and string theory. The next topic is a little bit about holographic field theory. Field theory. Field theory. Broader classes of microstate geometry. For simplicity, I've stayed entirely in five dimensions. But because we want to embed these in larger dimensions, there's also some really interesting math, math extent mathematic that underlies this. Underlies this. Um, now the topic is probe, probes. I'm probing these things. I, I think I will say something about that before we finish. There's the math, the underlying structure, broader classes, probing, and so forth. I think that'll do it. Oh, of course, the one thing I'm set up here, non-BPS. So I want to make remarks about almost all of these things in about half an hour. Um, but really what this says is that the course so far has been to try and get you up to speed or give you the ability to actually do make some basic microstate geometries in the simplest possible context. That's the state of the art as of about 2010. And there's been a hell of a lot of work since then which has developed this subject into a many, many, many directions. Any questions, though, before I go there? There was one question about, do we get the entropy? That has a lot to do with the holographic field theory and the broader class of microstate geometries. But there's also another comment I'll make about that in a minute. Any questions or comments before I go there? OK. So just a quick comment about M theory. The whole point is I worked entirely in five dimensions. The model I have been talking about really set out, started out its life in 11-dimensional supergravity. And all this, this class of, and it's just worth mentioning how it works. All of these things live naturally inside a much bigger string theory or M theory. So in fact, DS11 is the DS5 squared I've been messing with, this is to these lectures. And then it's decorated by, you can decorate it by a Calabi Yau, but the most stupid thing you can do is decorate it by a, a bunch of tori. Just add five more dimensions, six more dimensions, six DX7 squared DX8 squared, and I'm leaving spaces for an obvious thing, dx9 squared, dx9 squared, dx10 squared. And then there are factors here which are things like, let me get it right, z1, z3, z1, z2, z3 over z1 squared, z2, z3 over z1 squared times to the third. And then here there is z1. 1 z3 over z2 squared also to the third. And this one here is z1 z2 over z3 squared to the third. I'll say more about the, those terms in a minute. And then the three form potential is very, very simple. It's just basically the first electromagnetic field wedged into the volume form of the first torus plus the second electromagnetic field wedged into the volume of the next torus, plus the third electromagnetic field wedged into the volume of the last torus. You can do Calabi and K3 generalizations. This is called the STU model. It's the simplest of all of them. But basically, everything I've said is realized in 11-dimensional supergravity in a very simple way. That's the metric we've been messing with. This, these are the electromagnetic fields, which are three forms now, 
whether the one form on the space time and then the volume form here or the volume form here or the volume form here. And you may recognize these as being the scalars, basically x1, x2, and x3, with the constraint that x1, x2, x3 is 1. In other words, the scalars also turn up precisely as the volumes of these three T2 factors. There are generalizations of this. I want to just say that all of this, and the thinking behind all of this, is embedded in string theory or in M theory. And the things that I've been messing in five dimensions, I just want to get to the microstate geometries, but you should absolutely think of them as being part of M theory or type two. Theory. That's, I think, all I'm going to say there. I'll skip the holographic field theory unless Monica screams. But, uh, Sorry? No? It's just that I'm, stay, I'm try trying to stay for the sake of pedagogy into the sort of classical gravity stuff, and I don't want to get too much into the quantum stuff. Simple advertisement is that if you embed this in the right theory, the D1, D5, 2B system, you can do it, make a hell of a lot of mileage understanding the structure of these supergravity things in terms of the states of the dual conformal field theory. I might make some more comments about that at this time. Broader classes. This is where there has been a whole lot of discussion. So, obviously, you go to six dimensions. But this is actually more than just simply, oh, let's do one more. The point is that the geometries in five dimensions are kind of rigid, or seem to be rigid, although we've discovered not so much anymore. 5G geometries seem rigid. What do I mean by that? Well, all we get are bubbles and fluxes. And everything seems very topological. And that's the sense in which I seem, say they seem rigid. You know, there are lots and lots of these three n minus one parameters. And that's a large-ish moduli space, but it's nowhere near enough to store the entropy of a full black hole. So the question is, can you do something? And in these broader classes of things, you can actually, the first step is to say, well, let's add another dimension. Why add a sixth dimension? Because if you imagine the dimensions I'm working with, I've got, DT, I've got T, and then I've got Psi, for example, my Gibbons Hawking fiber, and then these vectors Y. You add another coordinate, which I'm going to schematically call V. This is the sixth dimension. Then it turns out you can calculate the BPS equations for the, including the sixth dimension. And everything can depend on V. Actually, let me call it Y. Ah, v. Depend on V. In particular, everything can fluctuate as a function of V. So that means Fourier modes. So once you go to six dimensions, there's a new thing you can seem to do, which is enable the entire geometry to fluctuate as a function of these extra coordinates. You can let the flux, one second, let the fluxes fluctuate, and the shapes, shapes of bubbles. Fluctuate. Monica, yeah. Because, um, you Sorry? That's M theory, yeah. Yes. Standard game of the. Yep. Indeed. Well, I, I, so what I have is this radius of this y circle. There's a radius of this circle, you, you call R sub y, which I typically choose to be somewhere around about the same compactification dimensions or possibly larger. I, typically, for the geometry, I take it, take it to be larger, and I don't want, because I don't want to think of, have to think about strings wrapping that circle. I want to just think about a regime in which the gravity is good. So I typically, when I do this, I take R y to be larger than alpha prime. I want it to be something I don't see in the world. But I, you know, what is 
don't know what, what is the current limit on how small extra dimensions can be. You know, it used to be a millimeter or something, but you know. I want this to be, sorry? Point two millimeters. Point two Thank you. So, so the point, okay, I want this to be point 0.1 millimeters. <laughs> so, so in other words, it's going to be at a scale you don't see in the, the experiment, but it's going to be the scale in which you start, ex another very important take home point, there's so many take home points from those children said, um, the five dimensional geometries, the bubbles explicitly use the fifth dimension. So the scale of all this stuff, the bubbles and everything, is the scale of the extra dimensions. And so these bubbles, if you encounter them, have to be, so what I'm saying is when you get towards these black holes and resolve them, you're actually exploring the fifth or sixth dimension significantly. And I want to allow them to be big enough that I can, my supergravity is good, um, but not too small such that I have to start using string theory in full force. Okay. Okay. So the new thing that turns up at six dimensions, although it's not, uh, uh, there's a caveat here, uh, having to do with the seam, is that we can let things now depend in detail on these extra dimensions. And if you go to seven or eight or nine or ten dimensions, the general thinking is there isn't much new that can happen, although we're, you know, this subject's all full of surprises. So the reason why six makes a huge qualitative change a priori is, in fact, you can now let the whole damn thing start wiggling as a function of the extra, those extra dimensions and those variables. And 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, all adding more dimensions does is it changes the central charge of essentially the set of oscillations, the set of motions you can do. And there's some good news and there's some bad news. The good news is the BPS equations a priori a nightmare. Generic BPS equations with fluctuating metrics, well, let me be more precise, there's a ds4 squared is a nightmare. We don't know how to deal with that. So we fix ds4 to be non-fluctuating and hyperkähler just as before. But everything else is allowed to fluctuate. This is choice. We don't know how to do any better. And then the BPS system's linear again. And we can analyze the hell out of it. And in particular, the electromagnetic fields, the ZIs, the thetas, can all fluctuate. So the shapes of the bubbles, the magnetic fluxes, all of these things can do some really cool things. And we can actually, those fluctuations, we now have significant control over the holographic dictionary as to what they mean. So this is the game that we've been playing in the last few years. Um, I said seam. We recently realized you can actually do some of this in five dimensions as well. You can actually have the bubbles fluctuate. Joseph and I, when we first started doing this, were driven by Riemannian thinking. So our starting point was to say, oh, look, I've got some Gibbons Hawking space, and I want to solve theta is equal to star theta. And so then I simply said, oh, well, OK, we'll say, let's just do the, do the thing. We're going to take AI is equal to uh, some ZI times DT to the D cycle, oh, sorry, ZI, um, K on V, let me call it BI, K on V. Psi plus A plus some Xi I. And we wanted this to be cohomological. So we picked this to be cohomology and cohomology exactly the same way you do in Riemann. Turns out that you can let theta be a function of psi and of phi with arbitrary modes. This is something I did with my student Sasha Tukov and with. Uh, Oh, uh, no, its origins were with uh, uh, Emil and uh, the MSW story, um, and Joseph and David Turton. But basically, you can do arbitrary moding, and Robert's been analyzing the hell out of this, um, in psi and phi, and still solve this, and produce microstate geometries. So all this to say, 
there are infinite towers of solutions. Even in the five-dimensional story, there are infinite towers of solutions to the starting equation, which have a dependence, which is e to the i m plus n psi plus m phi. You can produce solutions that have this dependence. So the cohomology of ambipolar, it only works in ambipolar spaces, the cohomology of ambipolar spaces is infinite dimensional. And so having realized we can make things wiggle in six, we realized we missed a whole bunch of things that can wiggle in five. So now what we've been doing is trying to understand what these things are, how to classify them, how to make geometries. What I want to finish on is a little bit about probing these geometries. And there was a surprise, which was kind of interesting. <coughs> There's also some lots of beautiful mathematics underpinning the understanding of this, which I'm not going to get into. But for those people who are interested, I've just told you that the cohomology of ambipolar spaces in four dimensions is infinite dimensional. That is wild, because you normally think of the cohomology of any halfway decent space as being finite dimensional and rigidly driven by this kind of stuff. Nope, there's a cohomology theory here which is rich and beautiful and infinite dimensional. And there's a whole story about the holonomy here, which is the, the holonomy or the monodromy of cycles and picard lefschetz theory. There's an SUN intersection matrix and there's an action of the Weyl group on the fluxes. What the hell is it here? It's an infinite dimensional Lie algebra probably, perhaps even a super algebra. The SUN here gets modified to SUN slash M superalgebra, where N and M, this is the number of plus charges, and this is the number of minus charges. There seems to be some superalgebra buried here, but I have no understanding what it is, but there's a very beautiful, probably a beautiful set of mathematics to be discovered. I want to finish on a much more physical note. And I want to start with the simplest possible description. These calculations have really been done in six dimensions, but I want to sort of pull out what I think is the general story. And the simplest possible thing to do is I'm going to talk about geodesics. We've recently been calculating green functions in some examples. Geodesics are really simple, and they give you already an interesting picture. So I want to contrast black holes with microstate geometries. And black holes sort of have this. They are AD, the cartoon is this is ADS cross S. The ADS is this way, and the S is this way. Microstate geometries look exactly like this. They start off looking exactly like this. They go down, they look like black holes. These are scaling microstate geometries, obviously. They look just like black holes, except at some finite distance down here, they cap. OK, so now, in a black hole metric, if I keep it simple, like a Schwarzschild, or I keep, a, keep it um, rise and Nordstrom extremal, there's one scale. Basically, the mass, or if you prefer, the charge. There's exactly one scale in the problem. And that charge sets the scale of the S or the scale of the ADS. In the black hole, situation, there are two scales. Sorry, the microstate geometry, there are two scales. So there's going to be a scale here, which is R of order, what I'll call B, which is up here. And B is secretly the charge, or the mass. So there's the same mass scale that sets the curving of the geometry up here, and I'll call it B. Because down here, at R is of order A, there's a second scale. So microstate geometries actually come with more than two scales. They come with three or four, at least. Very important, and there's, there's a third scale, which is the depth. But basically, in the simplest case, there are two scales in the microstate geometry. There's something up here, and there's something down here. Black holes have one scale. Yeah? No, no, no. I'm just thinking short. I'm thinking of the simplest extreme rise in Nordstrom. No, it's extremal. I'm um, MSQ. Okay. MSQ. Because these are BP everything I'm saying is BPS. And the importance, OK. Have as many parameters as you want here. You've got more here. And the more have everything to do with the fact there's a cap down here. So really importantly, the takeaway message is there's a cap here, which adds a whole bunch more scales to the problem. But I want to keep it really simple. I want to think about Schwarzschild or right, extreme rise right, and Mm 
Yes, exactly. There's one parameter. There's one. But all this to say that I'm just going to make a little ar simple argument. So remember, um, tidal forces. So I want to think about tidal forces on probes. And I'm going to do it very crudely to start with, and then I'm going to do it a little bit better. The tidal force on a probe, remember, is determined by the Riemann tensor. And typically, we construct the Riemann invariant, just to get an idea of what's going on. Sigma. And I'm going to put the, bot I'm going to put the singularity is at r equals 0. I'm going to change my coordinates a little bit. It puts the singularity here. Now, if you, let's put the horizon here. And it's r of order m, the horizon. So if you calculate the Riemann invariant, you can argue very simply what it has to be for pretty much a generic black hole. The Riemann tensor has dimensions of 1 over length squared. So that's going to have dimensions of 1 over length to the fourth. But for a black hole, remember the Riemann tensor is the curvature, is, is the tidal force. So in the same sense that the um, gravitational potential is m over r, the force is m over r squared. The tidal force is m over r cubed, because that's the derivative of the force. So to make the dimensions correct, this generically has that behavior. m squared over r to the sixth. It's got to have dimensions 1 over length squared. The only parameter of the game is m. And each Riemann tensor comes with a factor of m. Simple as that. And at the horizon, this goes as 1 over m to the fourth at the horizon. So this is the usual argument to say that black holes are like dogs. Small ones are nasty, and big ones are gentle. There we go. In other words, if the black hole is big enough, the tidal forces can be made arbitrarily small. And you can send a probe in. I can't remember. There's a fact where it goes, if you trotted out the other day, uh, it gets to be about 10 g on the surface of the 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole, something like that. Yeah, it's huge. But the biggest net, but you can survive it with a fighter plane. A fighter plane is designed to take 15G. So, so in other words, you, could, you, can, you can survive it. It's an intrinsically survivable thing. That's the usual argument. And so therefore, but another way of thinking of this is a very simple way to think about it, is that this is ADS cross S. And the one scale M sets the radius of the ADS cross S, or the Q. And so this is really 1 over the radius to the fourth. So basically, as the charge goes up, or the mass goes up, ordinary black holes are gentle. Now, there's a more sophisticated version of this, which is called the geodesic deviation equation, which actually illustrates something even more important. So geodesic deviation is that you imagine the following. You've got a bunch of geodesics all parallel, and you synchronize them. And they have some tangent velocity v mu. And then there's a displacement across, which you measure by s mu. And you can arrange by synchronization that s mu v mu is zero. What does that mean? It means if you go into the rest frame of this observer, then this guy is a space-like vector perpendicular to the observer. So if I go to a frame where v mu is 1, 0, 0, then s mu is some vector 0s. And so as a result, you should think of this as the deviation vector. It's called the deviation vector. Is a space-like displacement transverse to my direction of motion, but it's a displacement to my nearest neighbor. And you can normalize it, in fact, typically at one point, to make it 1, so that it, you look at something 1 meter away. And then you can ask, how does this change as we go down the proper time of the geodesic. You ask, how, what is the relative acceleration of these two points? How do they separate? It's called the equation of geodesic deviation. And there's a simple formula for it. Let's see. I think that's v rho v lambda s sigma. And this puts in very, very graphic terms 
how the curvature plays into the tidal force between neighboring geodesic particles. But what you should think of this as is the tidal stress. And in particular, the quantity which is made out of this is sometimes called the tidal tensor. Um, you, you. It's called the tidal tensor. And basically what happens is you plug in S, the displacement, and it gives you out the acceleration. And so really it tells you the acceleration per unit length, sometimes called the stress per unit mass. So this thing really measures the tidal stress. There are two parts of this. First of which, the thing I identified as the tidal force, but there's something else. It depends on the velocity, the proper fall velocities of the people falling in. And this reflects something you know if you've ever driven a car. If you don't want to destroy your car, you drive across cobbled streets slowly. In other words, it also cares about the fall velocity or the velocity across the bumps. And the tidal accelerations get much stronger if you hit bumps at relativistic speeds. So the picture I gave you initially was a little bit naive, but it was close good enough. OK, now, let's, we've talked about black holes. Let's talk about what happens generically in microstate geometries. So microstate geometries replicate black holes. So in particular, if I look at the tidal tensor, the tidal tensor, and I'm just going to take its norm. I'll take its biggest eigenvalue. I'll take the square root of the norm squared. You can do a bunch of different ways of doing this. But I just want to talk about what this contains. So it contains m over r cubed. Remember that I said that when I took Riemann squared, there was an m squared over r to the sixth. This is because it contains just a Riemann tensor, which is m over r cubed. This is black holes, and that's all you've got. And at r is of order m, this goes like 1 over m squared. It's the square root of the result I was giving before. You go over here and ask, what do you get? Well, you also get something which is what I'll call b over r cubed. There's plenty, that's exactly that term, because it replicates the black hole. And it replicates the tidal forces you feel here. But there are lots of other terms. There are higher multipole moments. From the cap. The fact that there's a cap present changes the multipole moments of the gravitational field. And there's one I want to focus on. It's got dimensions of 1 over length squared. It's a squared b squared over r to the sixth. This is really morally the dipole moment. Again, it's 1 over length squared is its dimension. But it contains all sorts of multipole moments in the gravitational field and in the tidal tensor. So this is in A contains. Notice that this goes away in the A goes to zero limit. Now remember, in a scaling geometry, you can always scale this infinitely deep. You can make A as, uh, as small as you like. You can take it to zero, in fact. And the tidal force from this goes away. So this is emphatically something about the fact there's a cap there. OK, so now let's look at what happens. First and foremost, this never gets big in the black hole until you hit the singularity. So it never gets big outside the horizon. M. Outside the horizon, or on the horizon. This can get big. Remember, the horizon is down here somewhere. There's no horizon in microstate geometries. So this, a squared b squared over r to the sixth, gets large at r is of order a, for example, because it takes a value, which then is something like b squared over a to the fourth. And the important point is that scaling is something like log of b over a. Uh, now I've got it the wrong way around. b over a is like log of lambda magnitude. 
effect. So as the scale factor goes to zero, B over A gets huge. B over A represents the depth of this throat or the redshift from top to bottom. And so what you're supposed to see is this number gets vast. It gets extremely large. And the measurement scale is the alpha prime or compactification scale. So tidal forces, when you hit the cap, get huge. But it's more interesting than that. It's not surprising. You drop something in. It picks up a lot of speed and then hits this cap, turns around, and comes back out again. But down here, it's turning itself around through some tight curvature at very high speed. And that's what's creating this large tidal force. But it's even more interesting. When you look at the, these geometries, you should also remember where you're dropping it from. And if you release the particle from the top of the throat, r of order b, and you let it go, then this gives you another factor, which is basically the, the tidal tensor gives you a squared b squared over r to the sixth. But these two velocity factors give you another factor of b from the release point. And so what actually happens is that when you have r is about the square root of ab, then this becomes of order so r squared of ab becomes the b's cancel, and you get 1 over a squared. In other words, what's happening here, 1 over a squared? No, 1 over a. What's happening here, and remember a is a small number, is that halfway down the throat, the tidal tensor is becoming of order 1. And that means that essentially about halfway down in geometric terms here, the tidal forces are getting so large that it's beginning to need to be described by string theory. In other words, all the compact and extra dimensions become probed by this infalling particle because of the tidal forces when you hit about halfway down the throat long before you hit the cap. And so what's really going on is you have these multipole moments due to the presence of the cap that are now being hugely amplified by the ultra-relativistic infall speed. And when you hit a region about halfway down in geometric terms, the tension, uh, th what it's going to do is it's going to start stressing the particle to such an extent that A, it will turn on the string excitations, or B, it will turn on the fluctuations in the extra dimensions that they can't become of the same energy order. So in other words, this is the point where it discovers that either there are extra dimensions in space or there are s the b spaces made out of string theory. So it's long before the cap that we see this if we release from up here. So what this means is that microstate geometries look pretty innocuous in that they make very small corrections to the basic result from black holes, but those corrections get hugely amplified when you, f when you fall from you know, the asymptotic region into the black hole, and you start discovering the extra dimensions and the stringiness of matter long before you get to the cap, long before you hit the horizon. So that's... Well, no, remember this depends on, it has to be a very high redshift. So it's not outside the horizon. You're approaching the horizon region. And so you're getting two things. You're beginning to see the gravitational multipoles. That's what this is. So you're getting to the near field of the cap. So you already had to be pretty damn close to the cap. But you can start experiencing it there. The same thing is you're falling from infinity. And you had to fall enough to get some rough speed up to get a huge speed. Actually, this should have been. This is the redshift factor. And so therefore, you have to have an ultra-relativistic speed. This is your gamma from your relativistic boost. And so that amplifies these lumps. So the, the microstate geometries are telling you, A, that the, the, um, when you get very close to the black hole, there are multipole moments. They fall off as r to the 6, not r cubed in this case. But they get hugely amplified by the ultra-relativistic speed of infalling matter. OK. so. Let me play a huge optimist, and then Monica can rain on my parade. But, but so, sort of last little speech about why this is important. Um, two things. First and foremost, um, microstate geometries, why should you take them seriously? They are, as I said in the first lectures, the only mechanism that semi-classically can support structure at the horizon scale. This is what it's doing. So in other words, anything else 
and it's just going to get flushed inside the horizon. You can't pretend to put anything like a firewall or any stringy matter at horizon scale because it just gets flushed in. Microstate geometry is the only known semi-classical mechanism to hold stuff up. So if you're going to talk, start talking about geometries near the horizon and putting stuff there, this is the only thing you can do if you want to have a semi-classical limit. The alternative is you pretend you've got some quantum mush, but you have no idea what you're doing. There's no way to calculate. Now, you erect your microstate geometry, you start studying matter falling in. You can ask yourself, can you make a prediction based on this? Well, the one thing we know about microstate geometries and we know about holographic theories is that they're very good at c capturing the large-scale collective phenomena of the microstructure. The best example of which is how we got the viscosity to entropy ratio in the quark gluon plasma. So you took some bullshit, you know, supergravity theory, and you calculate the entropy, um, the, the viscosity to entropy ratio, and you got it right on the money, exactly the right value for quark gluon plasmas. But this is something we've known for some time in holographic field theory. The supergravity limit gives you very large-scale collective effects of the, of the strongly coupled quantum system. So what I'm aiming at here is to talk about a large-scale collective effect of whatever the hell it is that's down here. And in particular, I suspect that this kind of dissipation of um, energy from the geometry into infalling matter will be some kind of effective hydrodynamic viscosity that's felt by the particle. Because what's happening here is it's going through in, into the, this particle's going in, it's secretly a string. It hits about halfway down, and suddenly it knows the tidal forces are ripping it apart, and it's now starting to oscillate like crazy. There's an energy transfer going into the particle. That's coming out of its speed. It's slowing down. That's a viscosity. So if I had to bet on the best possible outcome from this kind of calculation is I'll be able to predict an effective viscosity created by microstructure around the horizon scale that will then be observable as perhaps some viscosity on infalling particles. In principle observable, in practice, probably extremely hard because when you have stu when you look at an accretion disk, seeing anything close to the horizon is extremely hard. So in principle it's observable, in practice, I don't know whether you'll see it because, as I say, I've looked at some of the data from the creation disks, and it's really grubby. I mean, you know, so maybe. Monica, now you can rain on my parade. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Yes. Uh, okay. So large tidal forces, remember, if we're talking about a single string, you're only talking about dumping energy into the string. So it's one string that's getting somewhat excited. So one, no. It's still a string probe. However, if you start tipping lots of matter in, yes, obviously you have to look at that. But one string probe, so, so here's the, it, how to put it? Suppose I want to measure the viscosity of, of a, some hover, horrible fluid in a, in a system. I can put one test particle in and measure, and measure the force on that test particle. I don't have to think about the back reaction. I can still measure the viscosity. Yeah, Yes, and it is a big system up here. The quantum issues you're worried about are down here. No, they're not. No. The components of the Riemann tensor are still small, but they're being encountered at ultra relativistic speed. So it's a high, so you should think of it as a sudden approximation. Something is, this thing is cr hurtling through at ultra relativistic speed, seeing very small bumps which are being magnified by virtue of its ultra relativistic speed. So the probe is all. Yes. Okay. If, if it reaches here, yes, you've got to worry, and this is the deepest possible scaling throat, you have to worry about the quantum back reaction and all that stuff. But up here, you don't. There is a perfectly good approximation scheme. The geometry is reliable here. The quantization of the geometry does not affect the, set of the classical description. What matters here is there are small multipole deviations that are being magnified by the ultra relativistic speed of the probe. When you're down here, it's going to be probably quantum mush. Sorry, give somebody else a go for the moment then, yeah. So you said that at the zero point, yep. um, you know, something was becoming large and you needed to somehow resolve extra dimensions or strings. Yes. Like that. But does that mean something is becoming planking? Um, basic, well, there are many scales you can inject into the problem. So there are, there are at least three scales on the go. There's, there's Planck scale, there's a string scale, 
and there is the compactification scale. So what I didn't say in here, which is, is what does it mean to this to be large? And so this A squared is to be compared to something, string scale, Planck scale, or extra dimension scale. And it turns out that what it's to be compared to is a combination of all of the above. And in particular, if um, the, the extra dimensions are large compared to the string scale, or large compared to the, large compared to the Planck scale, then um, it will start exploring those extra dimensions first. If they're all about the same scale, it, it will start becoming stringy, and it will also start exploring the extra dimensions. So the, comparison, the thing to which this is compared is the volume of the compactification manifold to some crappy power, and the factor of Planck length 10 dimensions or something. Yes. But you're no longer a low energy observer when you get here. That's how the point. My question is, how would I know when I need to start adding new stuff? Well, it's, it's it, when the tidal forces get to the scale, you know, get to the scale of the extra dimensions. And you feel those tidal forces. You put your arm out. When does it get ripped off? When does the, uh, your arm get turned into fundamental particles? That's at a relatively low energy scale. Uh, no, you know how big you are. No, you know how big you are. You've got another scale. Th it's a tidal force, remember. And so the, you've got a laboratory, maybe 10 meters across. And so the question is, what is the stress force between the center of your laboratory and the edge of your laboratory? Is it enough to start ripping your laboratory into fundamental particles? So there's another scale which had to do with this deviation vector. So in this particular experiment, if you drop in a point particle, it duties go in, they come out, you don't see anything. But what we're thinking about is families of point particles that are neighboring each other. So there's another scale, which is that um, deviation vector. And so the question is, when I throw in some matter, it never goes in as perfectly as a point particle. It goes in as a blob of stuff. When does that? A string has a length. And so the question is, when is this excitation energy hitting the scale that you'll A, that it'll begin to explore the extra dimensions, or B, it will become intrinsically stringy excited? And it happens before you hit the structure of the microstate. These multipoles get ex hugely exaggerated by the, by the um, well, the multipoles are there, first of all. And the second thing is that they get very, very greatly amplified by the ultra relativistic speed you're falling in at. Monica, off you go. Um, if the, okay, so uh, as I said, it all depends what you have to compare A to. And what you compare A to is its volume of the T4 to some quarter power times the radius of Y and a factor of the Planck length of something other. I can't remember which it is. So whichever is the bigger of those, it explores first. So in other words, what I'm telling you is the supergravity approximation is, that I'm using is breaking down. The first way it's breaking down is interesting. If I have a large extra dimension that's small compared to what we see, but large compared to Planck scale, then it explores those right here. If they're all of the same scale, it's going to explore them more equally. So I've, I've got a hierarchy of scales. And I c if I make the lar extra dimensions large compared to Planck, then I can have say, oh, no, it's going to start realizing it's a 10-dimensional theory. Also. I can have it do, you know, look at the string. So Emil and I are moment doing calculation where we chuck a string in and seeing what happens. No, 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 the string has got tension and it's just going to start oscillating. What's happening is there's enough energy in your motion. <laughs> For what? This is a probable. No, 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 no. OK, when it starts falling in, it starts getting excited. It starts stretching. This is an adiabatic process. Look, I fire a proton through a bunch through, through, uh, I fire an electron through, through matter. There's an approximation where I fire it relatively gently. It doesn't go too nearly near the atoms. It ionizes a couple of atoms and leaves. That I can do. Then I can fire it progressively higher energies into denser matter, at which point it ionizes and vaporizes all the matter. There is an energy scale that you can start analyzing at. And I've got complete control over that, because I can look at what part of the throat it's entering. And it, as it begins to enter the throat, it begins to stretch a little. It begins to oscillate. If it makes it all the way down here, you're right. It will probably oscillate so much that it'll have a lot of energy, and it, it will start doing weird stuff. 
It's going to start exploring the extra dimensional energies first. Um, I think it's going to do that first. As I say, the, the calculation we're doing at the moment is we're looking at the string and seeing what the string does. And we're, starting, we're looking at the... Uh, so we, got, we, got, we can play a game with this, one of which is we can just say, let's look at what happens to the string as it starts entering here. What gets excited first? And when you go from here to here, when you hit it with a blast of this geometry, how much energy has been dumped in? There's going to be a point where if I blast too much energy in it, the back reaction becomes important. But th it is an adiabatic process in the sense that I can control it by not taking my favorite geometry, but I can take something rather shallower. And then I, then I get a gap which is large. So, uh, so I can mess with the depth of the throat. I can also look at a finite cross-section of the, of the infall process, and I can control this approximation pretty well. I'm in danger of giving a seminar on what we're working on at the moment rather than actually giving a class. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it's it's this is this is the leading interesting one, for for our favorite ones. Um, it's basically set by the gap, of the the holographic gap of the conformal field. One over one and five. Tiny, yeah. But I don't have to take that geometry. I, it's, so, so yeah, it's tiny. It's tiny. B over I is tiny, but I'm saying that. Okay. Are there any other questions that don't have? We, you can have. I'm going to talk about this on Monday, so you can have. We can have at it then when I will give a seminar about what we're working on. However, for the students or anybody else, any other questions? Uh, just yeah. Yep. Yep. And that A fluctuate with the uh, dimension, additional dimensions? Or so this A or the... Yeah, the um, basically, the what, what you can do is you, you, you have these bubbles in Gibbons Hawking geometry, these things I sort of drew as a cartoon. Um, and I sort of said they're sort of topologically rigid. Here's the psi circle. But they can develop wave shapes. They, the shapes matter. They can vibrate like a balloon. And those are actually still BPS. There are lots of BPS modes like that. It literally is like a vibrating balloon. And you can store information in them. You can store microstate structure. And it turns out in the holographic field theory, we know exactly what these things are. They're particular excitations of the holographic field theory. In fact, they're some of the excitations that were captured by Strominger and Waffer eons ago. In terms of they don't, still don't account for all the entropy. There is, still isn't enough. There's a whole other story here which may actually account for the entropy, which is work that was done by Martinek and Niehoff, where you can do other things like wrap brains around cycles. So the sort of broader question is, microstate geometry is the only way of holding stuff up. But now you take a, if you want to investigate the physics of stuff near the horizon scale, take a microstate geometry and put your favorite physics in it. And that's exactly what Martinek and Niehoff did. They looked at brains wrapping these cycles and argued that there are huge numbers of them. And maybe those are the ways of accounting for the entropy. So it's sort of a more, I even if you don't buy into the whole microstate geometry story that we're going to study the whole of microstructure of black holes using these geometries, they are still a tool in that you can take your favorite way of thinking about microstructure and you can study them in the neighborhood of horizon without worrying about the black hole eating everything you're studying. OK, I'm sure it's not. any other questions, guys? There's a lot more in the lecture notes, but uh, hopefully they're useful. Okay, we'll call it a day, I guess. Sure,